sorry, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of rattling of papers. Um, let's, as much as possible, let's try to, to keep the noise down because that, be, uh, that can be fairly distracting. Okay, well, let's continue to look at Jesus' prayer in John 17. And we're going to be looking at three verses this morning. And actually, these verses are so full, we could probably take and spend time on each one of these points and take up the whole time. But uh, as we, we do want not to miss, as it were, the, uh, the forest for the trees, uh, we're going to uh, look at these three verses. And what we want to see here is Jesus' prayer that we might be sanctified, that we might be made holy. John 17, I'd like to read for you these three verses in verses 17 through 19. This is what Jesus prays to the Father. And again, let me remind you as I read this, Jesus prayed this for His disciples. This is the upper room. Last Supper has already taken place. He is praying this specifically in the context for the disciples who are present. Now, Judas has already left, so he's not included in this group. And he's already reminded us of that fact last week. But we're going to see this evening as we look at the verses that follow this text that he is also praying for us. So I, I do want you to remember that as I read this. Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for me if we have trusted him. Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. As you can see, the burden of what Jesus is praying here is sanctification. And that's what we want to consider here this morning and why it's important to what it is that Jesus has called us to do. Now, this morning, as I've already said, we're continuing to look at the prayer that Jesus offered for His church as He was preparing to leave the world and return to His Father. On the evening when Jesus was to be betrayed, having already shared the Passover meal with His disciples, showing them how He would fulfill it through His sacrifice for them, and again, that's what the Lord's table reminds us of this morning having given them his final directions, his instructions, at least those he would give to them prior to his, his death, burial, and resurrection. We know that Jesus would minister to them a little bit later for 40 days and teach them a bit more. Judas, having already left to betray Jesus to the Jewish leaders, uh, to tell them where they would be able to find him so that they would arrest him. Knowing that in just a little while he was going to um, leave with them to go to Gethsemane, to pray for the strength, to face his father's wrath as it was poured out upon him for their sakes, he offered this prayer for his disciples. And again, for every one of us here who have trusted in him. Now we saw that Jesus, first of all, prayed for the strength that he needed to carry out his father's work. And that the Father, in turn, would glorify Him for the work which He was doing. He prayed that He might be able to gain eternal life, to do what was necessary through His life, through His sufferings, through His death, so that He would be able to give it freely to those whom the Father was giving to Him. In other words, that He might be able to give it to us. Then he began to pray for his disciples, for those who believed in him then, as well as for those who would believe in him through their word, which would include those of us here who believe this morning. He prayed for them that as he was leaving and there was much work yet to be done and many sheep to be gathered in, he prayed for our protection. He prayed that the Father would guard us even as Jesus had done for His disciples while He was on earth, that the Father would now do this for His disciples now that He was leaving. He prayed for us that we might eventually make it to heaven and to the glory which the Father has prepared for everyone who puts His trust in Him and serves Him in this life. Now, Jesus prayed, and He prayed openly. He prayed these things openly so that we would have the joy of knowing 
that through his prayers and through his continuing mediation in heaven, that we would make it to heaven eventually if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order that we might make it to heaven, Jesus prayed that the Father would keep us from two things in particular that could potentially destroy us if it were not for His grace, but by His grace that they're not going to destroy us because Jesus prays. The kingdom of the evil one in this world and the sin that is in our hearts from the evil that is without us and the evil that is inside of us. Now, last week, Jesus prayed that the Father would protect us from the first danger, the evil that is outside of us. The evil one who controls this world as well as the people who are in his kingdom, whom Jesus told us will hate us. Hate us because we belong to Jesus, we belong to his kingdom, and we no longer belong to the kingdom of darkness. And who will hate our message, the message we bring to them, because it convicts them of sin. And they don't like that. They, they don't like light in their face. They don't like to be told they're sinners. They don't like to feel guilty. But that is what the light will do. It, it, it reveals sin. Now, Jesus did not ask the Father to take us out of the world in order to protect us from the evil that is in the world. Rather, He prayed that He would keep us in the world and protect us because we need to stay here. We still have work to do, as we're going to be reminded again this morning. So Jesus prayed that the Father would protect us from the evil that is outside of us this morning. He prays that the Father would protect us from the second thing, the second danger, and that is the evil that is inside of us, that which could keep us at the very least from doing His work, but at the very most could destroy us, but for His grace. That is our sin. He prays for our sanctification. He prays that we might be holy in our hearts and therefore in our purpose in this world. Now, this morning, what I'd like us to do is consider three things from these three verses. First of all, Jesus' petition, His request, His prayer, that His Father would make us holy. Secondly, the reason why Jesus prays for this, because He has sent us into the world and then thirdly, the means that Jesus prays His Father would use to make us holy, and that is His truth and His Spirit. So first of all, let's look at Jesus' petition, that the Father would make us holy. He prays in verse 17, which actually gives to us a little bit of our third point, but we're just going to focus on the first point here. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, I hope we all understand by this time what sanctify means. Sanctify means to consecrate. It means to dedicate. It means to set apart from one thing to something else. It means to make holy or to purify. And what Jesus is praying here is that we would be purified, that we would be cleansed from the things that will get in our way of doing what it is He has left us in the world to do, that we would be purified from sin, because sin is what gets in the way. I think we all understand that much, if we understand anything about our Christian experience. Whenever we want to do what the Lord calls us to do, sin always rises up and tries to stop us. And as a matter of fact, it's pretty effective. Now, sin, as you know by its nature, is, is opposed to God. It stands against everything God wants, everything that God says is good, everything He knows is good. Now, God tells us what is good in His law. You know, I told you earlier this morning, the law of God basically is, is an expression of what is, you know, what's loving. It's a definition of love, and obviously love is good when it's defined the way God defines it. Well, the law tells us what is love. The law is good. Paul writes in Romans 7, verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. 
It's perfect, as a matter of fact. The problem is with us, not with the law. Whenever you begin to think that there's something bad about the law of God, you need to remind yourselves not to think that way because it is the definition, the very definition of goodness and of love, and that's the way we need to see it. Now, sin, on the other hand, is that which is opposed to the law of God. That's what John tells us in 1 John 3, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now, sin is the bad thing. Sin is what we're supposed to avoid, but what is sin? Well, Paul says, I wouldn't even know what sin was if God hadn't given me the law of God because it shows me what is good. Sin is everything that is opposed to the law. Sin is lawlessness. And as a matter of fact, John continues to write in verse 5 of 1 John 3 that the very reason why the Father sent His Son into the world was to take away sin, to break the power of sin, not just the guilt of sin, but the power of sin in our hearts, as we already read in Romans chapter 6. He says, you know that He, that is Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. Now, that's the very reason why Jesus here is praying for our sanctification. He came into the world in order to take away sin. He laid down His life so that He might cleanse us from the guilt of sin. He, he gave His life so that He might break the power of sin. He prays so that sin might be removed from us, that it might be cleansed out of our lives, that we might be purified from sin. And again, because sin gets in the way. Now, sin can also be characterized as selfishness. Sin is selfishness. I mean, the law of God is focused on God and our neighbor. Selfishness focuses upon self. Sin moves us to focus on what it is that we want, what we want out of life, what we would like to gain, what we'd like to, to have as far as possessions, and it thinks about our comforts and our needs and so forth, and rather than on what it is that God wants, you see. It, ha it causes us to put our needs and our wants even above the needs of others. And yet God calls us to love others as we love ourselves. Now, you know our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to serve Him, to serve Him by becoming servants to others. And that's just the opposite of selfishness, isn't it? Where I'm serving myself, that's selfishness, but when I'm serving others, well, that, that's servanthood. If we are constantly serving ourselves, we're never going to be able to do what our Lord calls us to do. And so Jesus prays that the Father would sanctify us, that He would set us apart from sin, that He would set us apart from selfishness. Sanctify them, Jesus prays. But now, what, why does he pray that? What is the reason? Well, it's because of what Jesus is calling us to do, to go into the world with his gospel to serve others by bringing it to them. He prays in verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, as long as sin is strong in our hearts, we're not going to be very effective in the world. As a matter of fact, we're not even, we're not even going to get out there and, and engage the world because we're going to be too vulnerable to the world. There's a lot of stuff out there in the world that's going to trip us up. We are going to be vulnerable to the traps that Satan has set everywhere in the world unless the sin is overcome in our hearts. And as long as we are living for ourselves, as long as we're living selfishly, we will not want the inconvenience that it's going to cost us to take His gospel to others. Sin and selfishness has to be overcome before we're going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. Sending an unsanctified believer into the world, and by the way, I need to qualify that a little bit. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness is given to us, we are holy, we are sanctified positionally in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to go to heaven, but personally, we can be still unsanctified. 
we can still be undisciplined. We can still be selfish. We can still have un, undefeated, unmortified, unkilled sin in our hearts. And as long as we are in that condition and to the degree that we are, then when He sends us into the world on this errand, it is an errand that is doomed to failure. It's like hiring somebody who is greedy, a thief, let's say, to guard a bank. You're not going to do that because that person isn't going to be able to do it very effectively. Or maybe have a drug addict watch over a pharmacy. No, we're not going to do that either because there's going to be too much of a desire for those things and they're going to want to take them and do the wrong things with them. Just like you wouldn't hire somebody who's lazy to do hard work. We have to be equipped. Now, as long as we are in that condition, as long as we want the things of the world, we're going to be an easy prey for the world. In terms of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, we're, we're going to make our home in Vanity Fair. We're not going to want to leave, and we're going to be powerless against the world's influences. As long as we are focusing upon ourselves and serving ourselves only, we're not going to be willing to do the hard work that our Lord calls us to do. Now, I do want you to realize here that, that what Jesus is praying for is something that He had to undergo in His own life in order to, to, to do what His Father called Him to do. Remember, He is our example, and we are to follow Him. Jesus is simply praying that the Father would do for us what the Father did for Him. Jesus had to be sanctified to do what His Father had called Him to do. If you remember back in John chapter 10, verses 35 through 36, Jesus said this, If He called them gods to whom the Word of God came and the Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of Him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? Now, forget about the part, we already looked at that earlier, what it means when He says you are gods and so forth. But look at what he says the Father did to him or for him. The Father sanctified him and sent him into the world. Jesus had to be sanctified and sent. Now, Jesus is praying for our sanctification, and he is sending us. Do you see the, the parallel between those two things? And he's going to tell us in verse 19 of our text that even before he could sanctify us, he had to sanctify himself so we need to come to grips with this principle of sanctification. We need to be sanctified if we are going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, getting back to Jesus, this does not mean that Jesus was struggling with sin and selfishness. He was not struggling with sin and selfishness. He doesn't have the same problems we have. He was never guilty of sin. He was never selfish. But what this means is that He was set apart by the Father and sent into the world to do a particular work. Notice the sanctification, set apart and was consecrated. He was dedicated to this particular work. And while he was in this world, he singularly pursued that work and that work alone without letting anything get in his way. Remember how when it was time for him to go to Jerusalem, he set his face like flint and he wasn't going to let anything stop him from going to Jerusalem to lay down his life. He was sanctified, set apart, dedicated, devoted to that one purpose, to do what the Father sent him into the world to do. Now, if we are to do the work that the Lord calls us to do, Jesus knows and he prays that we would be sanctified because that is what we need. The sin in our hearts has to be broken. And of course, if we are believers, it has been broken by the power of the Holy Spirit. The sin that remains in our hearts after that breaking, after that being set free, needs to be put to death. Well, that's something also the Spirit does. But we are involved in that work. That's not something that happens automatically. And with that sin that remains, that needs to be put to death, our self-centeredness needs also to die our desire to serve ourselves. And we must put on the heart of a servant if we are to follow Jesus' example, if we are to have the kind of devotion that we need to advance God's kingdom. And that's why Jesus prays 
for us that we might be sanctified. Now finally, understanding that this is what Jesus is praying and this is why He's praying it, we do need to see what it is that Jesus is praying that His Father would use to sanctify us. Because it is a work that we're involved in, something, or something we have to do, and so we need to know what the tools are that, that the Lord has given to us in order to accomplish this work. Well, what the Father uses and what Jesus prays the Father will use is the truth made powerful by the Spirit, going back to verse 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Or more accurately, I believe it could be translated, purify them by means of the truth. Now, what truth is he referring to here? Well, you know there's only one truth by which we can know good and evil. The one truth by which God will do His work, and that is His Word. Jesus says in verse 18, Your Word is truth. Now, God does reveal His truth, the truth of His existence. He shows us what He is like in nature. God shows us something of His moral standards in our hearts through conscience. But it's only in His Word that we have the clear revelation of His will, of who He is, of His holy character, of what it is He wants us to be in His law. It's only in His Word that He has given us His gospel, which we know is alone able to free us from our sin and selfishness and actually give us the power to keep the law. You realize that the Lord never intended the law to save us. You can't keep the Ten Commandments and make it to heaven. You're never going to be good enough. You've already broken them as you come into the world. We've all failed in Adam. We've all broken them time and again. We can't suddenly keep the commandments, and even if we could keep them perfectly at some point in our lives and keep them perfectly to the end of our lives, we'd never be able to deal with all the times we've broken them before we started keeping them. But the fact is, the Bible says we can't keep them at any time. We don't have the power. We might be able to look like we're keeping them. We might be able to go through the motions of keeping them, but we can't do it because we love the Lord. We can't do it for His glory apart from His Spirit because apart from the Spirit we cannot love Him and we do not desire His glory. That's why we need the gospel. That's why Jesus had to come into the world to lay down His life in order that He might, again, cleanse us of our sins, break the power of sin, give to us His Holy Spirit so that we might be able to believe. That gospel is in His Word. And that's the only way we can be saved and be given the power to obey and to put to death our sin is through the gospel. So this is where you need to start. This is where it has to begin. And this is only in His Word. It's not in nature. It's not in your conscience. It's only in the Word of God. And, of course, it's only by His Holy Spirit who makes the gospel powerful the Bible tells us that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, but there's many people who hear it who are unaffected by it. Why is that? It's because the Spirit of God has to work through the gospel. He's the one who makes it powerful to save. He's the one who uses it to transform our lives. He's the one who enables us to believe. He's the one who breaks the power of sin. He's the one who frees us from sin and gives us the ability to obey. Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth, and that truth is God's Word. And in order that that truth might have the power to make us holy, Jesus said, He sanctified Himself. He was sanctified by the Father and sent into the world, and in the world He set Himself apart to do His Father's work, set His eyes on the cross, would not turn to the left or to the right, so that He might do what was necessary to give us His Holy Spirit, so that the power of sin might be broken in our hearts, so that we might trust the Lord Jesus Christ to believe, so that we might have the power to put our sins to death, so that we might be sanctified and set apart for His service, so that Jesus might send us into the world. Jesus prays in verse 19, For their sakes I sanctify myself. <laughs> 
that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. If Jesus had not done this, there would be no gospel. If Jesus had not done this, there would be no provision of the Holy Spirit, no gift of the Holy Spirit to make the word powerful to save and to sanctify. Jesus had to sanctify himself, set himself apart to do that work the Father called him to do so that we could be sanctified. And so as Jesus was sanctified and sent into the world, as he sanctified himself and went to the cross so that we would be sanctified, so Jesus prays for our sanctification because he is sending us into the world. We need to be sanctified. We need to be holy. So Jesus prays that we might be purified so that we might be effective in bringing his gospel to others. So in closing, let's just ask this question. What should we do? What should we do with these things? Well, first of all, we should remember that this is our purpose in the world to bring the gospel. We've been sent into the world with a particular purpose. That's why the Lord left us here. Yes, we are to gather and we are to worship. This is one of the, the, the duties we have, and it's a glorious duty, and it's one that we look forward to and one that we enjoy because we love the Lord and we want to worship Him. But this is also where we are equipped and strengthened to, when we use the means God has given to us to strengthen us. But our purpose in the world is to advance His kingdom, to glorify Him. That's why we're here. That's why He has sent us. That's why we're not in heaven right now worshiping God in heaven because, we, as we saw last week, we can't evangelize from heaven. It's kind of hard. It's too far away. We can't interact with people from there. The Lord leaves us here so that we can get to know people so we can share the gospel with them. Now, secondly, we need to remember that Jesus is praying for us so that we will be able to do this and to do it well. Now, what he, to, to do what He has called us to do. And, and the fact that the Father hears the prayers of His Son and we know that He answers His prayer should be an encouragement to us that when Jesus prayed for us, that the Father is, is going to answer that prayer. The Father has answered that prayer. And we have all the means at our disposal actually to do what the Lord has called us to do. But thirdly, we also need to remember this doesn't happen automatically. Jesus' prayer, I don't want to be irreverent here, but it's not enough. It, it accomplishes the purpose that Jesus intended, which is that the Father would make His truth powerful by His Holy Spirit, but there is also something that we must do. We need to use the means that the Lord has given to us, that Jesus prayed His Father would make effective in purifying our lives. We need to use the truth, the Word of God. We need to study it. We need to meditate on it. We need to let it convict us and point out our sins. As James says, it's like a mirror that we look into and we can see all the blemishes that are in our, you know, on our face, as it were, all the sin in our lives. We don't just put the mirror down and walk away. We need to see where those blemishes are and we need to work on cleaning them up by the power of the Holy Spirit, repenting of those sins, putting them to death, and then doing, of course, the right thing. We need to apply the Word of God. In the areas we're doing things that are wrong, we need to stop doing those wrong things. And in the areas where we're not doing what's right, we need to start doing those right things, including sharing the gospel with as many people as we can. I mean, let's just, all of us have a sort of a moment of honesty. Think about the number of people that we could have shared the gospel with that we didn't. Think about the people around us that we know that we haven't shared the gospel with, whom we could at any moment just by walking up to them and talking with them. Have we been doing that? Well, that's what Jesus calls us to do, to share the gospel, not to wait for them to come up and say, what must I do to be saved? but going to them and telling them, you need to be saved. Uh, and again, there's a variety of ways that, that we should go about doing that, but that would be, of course, a very lengthy subject to think about. But we need to try to reach out to them and not let the days, the weeks, and the months go by without telling them
that they need the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to use the other means that the Lord has given to us as well to gain more of the power of the Holy Spirit because He is the one who gives us the want to. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, we want to do what the Lord calls us to do. We don't need, you know, the, the, the command as it were. I mean, when Paul says to Timothy that, that the law was made for the lawless, he's talking about it was meant to keep them in check. If you have the Spirit of God in your heart and you have the law of God written on your hearts, you want to do it. You don't need a law to tell you to do it, although sometimes we find we do because we, the Spirit is not as strong in us as He needs to be. We need to use the Word of God. That's one way we get more of the help of the Holy Spirit. But there are other ways as well, and we need to be using those other ways. Prayer. Spend time in prayer. Seek the Lord for His mercy. Ask Him for strength. Worship. That's what we're doing right here. If we're receiving what the Lord is telling us by faith, we are being strengthened by His Spirit in our souls. We need fellowship. Again, not just getting together and as Christians or, you know, and just kind of talking about things of the world and, you know, things that, that are entertaining, but actually ministering our gifts to one another and seeking to build one another up in Christ. That's where fellowship becomes a means of grace and a way of strengthening our lives so that we might do the Lord's work. And then there is the Lord's table. The Lord's table is not just a memorial to remind us what Jesus did, although it is that. I say it's not just that. It is that, but it's more. This is a spiritual meal. This Jesus, actually, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, the meal here is a, a, a fellowship, a communion, that's why we call it communion, with the body and blood of the Lord, not in a physical sense. I mean, there's no body and blood here. There are only symbols of the body and blood of Christ, the humanity of Christ, by which He came into the world, lived and died for us so that He might be the bread of life to us. Remember how He said on one occasion, my blood is true drink and my, my body is true food. Uh, nobody ever drank His blood and, and ate His flesh, regardless of what anybody thinks in the world, that's never happened. Jesus was entirely whole when He went to the cross. He was buried and He was raised. His body is in heaven. Nobody is eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But what he meant by this is simply that he becomes for us the bread of life. He is the manna which comes down from heaven that if a person eat from it, he will not die but live forever. He is spiritual food. But the food that he gives us, of course, is not his, his literal body, but rather it is the spirit. He gives us the spirit. That is what nourishes our souls and so when we have communion with His body and blood in the Lord's table, we are actually having a, a participation in the Spirit of God. We are being filled with the Spirit of God. We are being nourished spiritually. We need to understand that as we come to the table because this is a very important way by which God actually gives to us more of that power and strength to be able to, to be sanctified so that we will go into the world and be effective without becoming like the world and that we'll want to go to the world and not just think about ourselves and what we want and what makes us comfortable. We'll begin to love our neighbors, we love ourselves and reach out to them with the gospel. That doesn't mean we can't comfort ourselves, it doesn't mean we can't rest or entertain ourselves, but what it means is we can't focus on that. That can't be our life, our life, our primary purpose for being in this world is to be lights in the world and to be witnesses of this truth, this message, which alone can save. We have a treasure that we are to, to give away. And even if people don't see it as the pearl that it is, even if they are those who would trample them under their feet, there are people who won't see it that way. There are people who will receive it by God's grace. And that's why we reach out with the gospel. We don't know who they are in advance. We have to find out by testing the waters. So let's be willing to test the waters because that's what our Lord calls us to do. And let's prepare as we, as we come to the table, let's prepare to receive that help of the Holy Spirit, that, that grace we need, that strength we need to have the desire to do what the Lord calls us to do.
Now, again, as we prepare to come to the table, let's also be reminded that um, we do need to be trusting in Jesus. We have to believe in Him, trusting Him as our only hope of heaven. We have to be willing to turn away from all of our sins, turn away from the things of the world which are evil, turn away from, again, our sins can be negative and positive. We're, you know, doing things we shouldn't be doing, not doing things we should be doing. We need to repent of all of our sins. And as we come to the table to look to the Lord and to ask Him for the grace we need to be able to overcome those sins and to become what our Lord calls us to become so that we might do what He calls us to do. Let's not always be preparing and never doing. The kingdom of heaven doesn't advance in that way. We need to, to grow up. We need to become mature in the Lord. We need to have His strength so we can do what He calls us to do. We will certainly, as we do what the Lord calls us to do, He will fill us with joy. It's worth anything that we have to pay Paul, you know, was, was abused and he suffered more than anybody suffered in the whole world. How many times he was beaten with rods, how many times stoned, how many times shipwrecked, left out in the cold, exposed. I mean, he goes in this whole list of things in 2 Corinthians, and yet he was the one who was filled with the most joy because he was doing these things for the one that he loved. And he was suffering these things because of Christ. And so he rejoiced in that. There is no greater joy and standing in the Lord's place and taking the abuse that was meant for Him upon yourself because you love Him. That's, that is one of the great joys and pleasures that the Lord actually has for us in the world if we're willing, again, to show ourselves to be Christians and to do what the Lord calls us to do. Well, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table.